Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. I'd like to thank Dr. Hampson, as well as the other leaders and organizers of the COVID lecture series for giving me this opportunity. My name is Dr. James Smith. I'm the Director of Male Reproductive Health at UCSF, and I'm going to talk for the next half hour to 45 minutes about fertility preservation and restoration options for children, adolescents, and transgender youth, as well as young adults. So one of, one of the things that has been really exciting, um, but then also opens up a new opportunities is that um, oncologists and other, other experts for cancer patients, treatments for these conditions have led to uh, increasing survival for, for patient, patients who are being treated for their underlying malignancies. As you can see in this, this figure, mortality has declined or survival rates have improved as decades have gone by. And with the large number of patients who are diagnosed, about 850,000 uh, back in 214 in numbers that are typically growing each year, 4,000 boys um, annually, and reproduction is often now one of the major uh, long-term survivorship concerns for these patients. For adults or for post-pubertal patients, fertility preservation is well-established. For other patients, for transgender patients and prepubertal patients, um, it's more complicated. So to start, I'd like to discuss a 29-year-old patient with testicular cancer. And the patient had was presented with a desire for fertility after testicular cancer treatment. Patient undergone a right orchiectomy three years ago and did not bank sperm at that time. Patient underwent three cycles of BEP and the spouse, as she sits and discusses uh, the clinical situation with you, uh, she tells you that she's 27 years old, she's never been pregnant before and has regular cycles. As you begin your standard evaluation for this patient, you obtain FSH and testosterone, luteinizing hormone, and you see that the patient has markedly elevated FSH, a normal testosterone level, but also a quite elevated luteinizing hormone level. Patient does have sperm in the ejaculate, but this, but this sperm is basically all, all dead. It's un, unusable. There's no moving sperm in this sample. So to back up a step and to give more perspective, essentially there are a range of different possibilities from a reproductive standpoint that cancer treatment can uh, cause for sperm quality. It can cause zero sperm counts, rhizospermia, and cause severe decreases in sperm count, or it can also cause declines in motility called asthenospermia. And potentially certain, uh, particularly novel chemotherapeutic agents may qua cause poor quality sperm or impairments in functional infertility that aren't necessarily measured in a standard semen analysis. Certain spine and pelvic surgeries can lead to an inability to ejaculate and and a number of therapies can lead to hypogonadism. So therapies that are generally on the lower risk are treatments such as vincristine, methotrexate, actinomycin, mercaptopurine, and, and, and these listed here in this slide. Um, while these, these are certainly not guaranteed to cause fertility problems, there are no, no risk chemotherapy. So an idea that has evolved over time is what would often happen is people would decide they weren't going to bank a sample because a patient was receiving a lower risk uh, agent. But these, these agents still can impair fertility. And a problem is, is that if a person starts with a lower risk therapy and then a short time thereafter needs a higher risk therapy, they're often not a candidate for our banking. In thinking about some of the novel targeted agents, um, there really is not a whole lot known yet. In some preliminary data, um, our lab and, and now others have, have explored this relationship for uh, agents such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Tyrosine kinase is important for key functional steps of uh, properties of sperm, such as capacitation and the acrosome reaction. And so while tyrosine kinase inhibitors may or may not affect bulk semen analysis parameters, it's possible that they may negatively impact capacitation and acrosome reaction. Higher risk therapies are those that are commonly given for this patient in this, this uh, vignette. And so therapies like cisplatin, uh, doxorubicin, carboplatin, ABVD, these are therapies that are have a higher chance of permanent sterility. But even with this, the majority of patients will recover after an extended period of time. And then the highest risk therapies are the alkylating agents, uh, mustard agents, 
listed in, in this particular slide. And, and these agents often given as induction therapy prior to uh, bone marrow stem cell transplants have a very high risk of, uh, of testicular sperm cell uh, failure. Radiation, uh, it, it's, its impact from a reproductive health standpoint depends a lot on its location. Where is the radiation being administered? And what is the dose? The higher the dose, even often at, a, often at relatively low doses, can cause permanent azospermia. And this is not an all or nothing phenomenon, the, uh, but it is dose responsive. As the dose goes up, the risk of permanent impairment increases as well. Uh, Latex cell function, testosterone production is more robust and, and survives higher doses. But still, as you can see from the numbers on, on this slide, permanent hypogonadism can, can um, occur as, as dose to the testicle increases. So for this patient, uh, this patient has essentially virtual azospermia, still had sperm, but essentially would fall roughly into this non-obstructive azospermia category. The elevated FSH puts this patient in that category, the history of prior chemotherapy. So the options you can present to this patient are they could consider doing a micro tessy with in vitro fertilization. They could consider using donor sperm and then partner would not need to do in vitro fertilization, but rather could use intrauterine insemination or they consider adoption. So this, this technique, the micro tessy technique is one as can be done under sedation. Um, this is the standard way that we do it here at UCSF. It can also be done under a general anesthetic in the operating room. Generally takes several hours to do the procedure um, and it can take many hours more than that to dissect through this tissue in, in the lab and look for very small numbers of sperm. The, the technical procedure itself, it once uh, surgically, as the testicles opened, it's, it is uh, intended to be a less invasive way, or at least a targeted way of identifying dilated tubules within the testicle so that a relatively limited amount of testicular tissue is, is obtained. Overall, for patients like the one that we're presenting here who've been exposed to some degree of chemotherapy, um, have about a one in three chance of successfully retrieving sperm. Um, patients who have ejaculated sperm in the sample, like in this vignette, have a much higher chance of success. Patients who've had prior alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide have a lower chance of success. When sperm is found, chance of actually getting pregnant is, is pretty high and 50% chance of getting pregnant and about a 42% live birth weight. And you can see in the, the table here that Patients who have testicular cancer are in the much better category of successfully retrieving sperm, and often because the chemotherapy is, is less toxic compared to other, other patients who are going on to have bone marrow transplants or having alkylating agents have lower chances of success. Now, when you think about fertility preservation for your patients, the standard approach is essentially to bank a semen sample or for patients who are unable to ejaculate due to discomfort or other reasons related to their, their malignancy, testicular sperm extraction is possible. Now, when you get sperm out and you bank sperm, sperm can be used either for um, IUI or IVF, depending on how much sperm is available. And when you utilize testicular sperm extraction, an in vitro fertilization technique is, is necessary. Now, IUI um, is a more straightforward and less expensive technique and requires ovulation induction medication, oftentimes, but not always, an ultrasound to measure follicular size. Once the follicles, typically one or sometimes two, have reached a large enough size, a dose of HCG is administered to the patient. Um, often the semen sample is uh, washed by a variety of techniques. Um, sample is uh, injected into the uterus through a catheter that passes the, the cervix, and then a pregnancy test a few weeks later. Now for uh, most labs to consider this technique, um, you need at least 5 million moving sperm in the thawed semen sample. The cost is much more modest than in vitro fertilization, but also the success rate is lower and is probably no better than 15, perhaps 20%, depending a lot on, on partner age. A young, healthy partner could be 20% chance um, of achieving a pregnancy. In vitro fertilization is a much more involved process and requires ovarian hyperstimulation. So a woman is generally giving herself injections with gonadotropins. Uh, 
at the end of uh, around two weeks of 10 days to two weeks of doing this, a transvaginal procedure is performed to aspirate follicles, aspirate eggs from the ovary. Then in the lab, as you can see in the picture of the, the bottom left of this slide, the sperm and the egg are brought together. Fertilization ideally occurs. Um, the, the embryo now is incubated for a period of three to five days. And then generally one or, or more embryos is transferred back to the patient that uh, to the uh, patient's partner uh, at that time and a pregnancy test a couple of weeks later. You need a very small number of sperm. So if, even for patients who have very, very low numbers of sperm, this can be a very successful technique. Um, it, some of the significant challenges from an access to care standpoint, however, is this is quite an expensive process and often not covered very well by insurance. So from a fertility preservation stand, standpoint, providers who are caring for patients in these groups should be comfortable either discussing the risk of infertility with their cancer patients or referring them over to a specialist who um, can uh, consult with these patients. Um, from a, um, a workflow standpoint, it's often pretty complicated and it can be time consuming and this leads to significant barriers. So in-house patients, um, often at UCSF, our process is to call a urology consult and order necessary virology labs. The reason for ordering these virology labs is that after the sample is banked, if you don't have the virology labs, these samples can often not be used by fertility centers. So it's, it's really important that, that these, sam these samples be tested for FDA required um, lab tests. Uh, we'll often schedule then an appointment with me uh, or one of the other fertility specialists. Um, patient uh, will be uh, producing a semen sample, sometimes often in-house in their, their uh, hospital room. Um, either family or a courier will take the sample over to the reproductive facility and the, the sample is frozen, data stored, and then they have a consult with me after that to discuss how many samples should be banked. As now patient, um, it still can be complicated for some patients. Patients are referred, uh, appointment scheduled for banking. Um, I, I or my nurse practitioner sees the patient. These FDA labs are ordered. Consent is, is obtained. Sample is, patient produces one or more samples. And then we have a follow-up often by telemedicine visit to discuss these results. All of these are complicated, require a lot of logistical support. And so working with the local teams, the oncology teams, uh, schedulers, social workers, and, and urology teams to facilitate this is time consuming. And it's important to set these up ahead of time. And, and they lead to some of the reasons why patients often aren't banking samples. And these logistics make it more difficult Banking itself can be expensive, and the, the infrastructure for, for doing this um, is, is often not, not universally available. Some doctors or patients also will feel that they're in a low-risk group and they don't need to necessarily bank. And so when there is this perception of a small fertility threat, um, they, they won't bank. They say this is too big of a hassle. Um, but some of these patients will go on to uh, more toxic therapy and then be unable to bank. Um, and in situations, as we'll get into a little bit later in this, this discussion, uh, that for prepubertal patients, these techniques for preserving um, sperm stem cells remain experimental. Patients who don't bank um, often do have significant regret about not at least attempting to preserve their, their fertility. So again, to emphasize this point, it's really important to refer patients early, um, particularly from a pediatric standpoint. Um, it's also important to note that patients with some malignancies, the samples don't necessarily uh, thaw very well. Typically we expect about a 50% thaw rate. You lose essentially half of your semen sample. <clears throat> but for some cancer patients you can lose as much as 90% of that sample. And at least at UCSF, we generally will not allow patients to bank a sample if it's been shorter than about six months from the time of, of chemotherapy. Um, so as far as there, it is possible that it, you can improve this system and uh, working with biotech partners may 
allow um, a chance of improving this system. So shifting to a, uh, a young, young patient, this patient was a three-year-old boy who was brought to the emergency room in status epilepticus. An MRI reveals a hypervascular left periventricular mass, extensive edema, and a midline shift. The patient underwent a gross total resection of the tumor. There was a lot of blood loss, but he ultimately did pretty well with that. And the final pathology was a choroid plexus carcinoma. So his oncologist recommended, according to a clinical trial, a treatment of vincristine, methotrexate, topicide, cytoxin, and cisplatin. And the plan was to initiate chemotherapy the following week. So he was going to be receiving a lumbar puncture as a puncture in a central line. And so his parents, um, a cardiologist and a psychologist here at UCSF, ask about the risk of fertility and about measures to preserve his fertility. So again, as we talked a few, few minutes ago, the standard approach would be to um, uh, bank sperm for postpubertal patients, but for patients who um, are prepubertal, there are no sperm cells there. So would it be possible to take a testicular biopsy, freeze that tissue, and then either grow sperm from stem cells or potentially to uh, transplant those cells back to the, the patient at a later date and restore fertility? The, the biopsy itself is a relatively straightforward technical procedure. Um, generally takes around 30 minutes or so. Um, often I'll combine this procedure with others like uh, central line placement or bone marrow biopsies. The testicular tissue is cryopreserved. And in, again, these are stem cells as well as uh, niche cells within the testicle that are being frozen, but there, there are no sperm cells. The biggest challenge here is often logistical. It's finding uh, the pediatric urology team or me and, and, and uh, having the schedules line up with that of the oncology teams. And so again, establishing systems ahead of time is, is really important. From there are important ethical and religious considerations as well for many patients. And so in terms of the, these key principles, keeping in mind, respecting the autonomy of the, the patient, particularly for older patients and adolescents, um, uh, parents, thinking about doing good for, for patients, not harming patients, and also the critical issue of tissue ownership and consenting. So from an autonomy standpoint, really working hard to respect individual preferences. Asking yourself though about the competence of a child to be able to make decisions. And in this case, with a three-year-old child, clearly the parents are going to be the ultimate decision maker, but it gets uh, more, it is more important to involve children um, the older they get. And at UCSF between seven and 12 is the area for us where we require an assenting process and having the, this young child being on uh, an active part of the discussion, but also respecting parents' rights to make decisions for their patients. And generally we'll follow this uh, as part of our work, the right to an open future, essentially not um, limiting uh, options or keeping options open for these children in the future. We wanna do good for these patients by potentially offering testicular tissue cryopreservation, but some very important questions remain. How soon will this type of cryopreservation really offer a realistic chance at um, preserving fertility? It still, as you'll hear a few slides from now, it still remains um, not possible to uh, generate sperm from prepubertal patients. Um, and is it reasonable to assume that a three-year-old child today in 20 years or 30 years, will uh, we will have the techniques to uh, utilize those samples? For the time being, this type of work should be done within IRB protected, uh, IRB approved research protocols. From a not hurting patient standpoint, many patients will retain fertility. So even a patient who's undergoing a bone marrow transplant, a percent of these patients, probably 10% or so, perhaps higher, um, will still retain fertility. So how much potential harm that we're doing is acceptable in this case? In general, um, I've been uh, very pleased to, to see that the, the, the risks of the biopsy itself are low. Um, in terms of short term, is often very mild bruising or swelling. Discomfort is usually very mild. Um, from a long-term standpoint, we don't know yet of any additive 
in terms of additive to the chemotherapy they're already going to be getting, risk of diminished fertility or hypogonadism. And I'm often asked about potential cosmetic risk or decrease in size. I will, uh, as part of our protocol, take about 5% to 10% of uh, uh, the volume of one, one testis, and I would not anticipate any long-term cosmetic risk for these patients. Now, what about, what do we do with tissue um, in the event of a patient death? Um, so for adult patients, as we're consenting them, we generally give them three options. And so we would give them not only these two options, to uh, sign off on. Patient could either elect to discard the sample, perform research on the sample and then discard it, or we would give the option for allowing a spouse or significant other to have access to that tissue. But for a uh, child who's under 18 years old, we do not allow that option. Um, so if we've stored a sample when the child is 10 and they come back and see us eight years later and they're 18, then they can, they can opt for, for other other choices specifically to have a partner decide what to do with the sample in the event of their death. So are we doing more good than harm? Um, you know, the, the, we feel the parents dis, should decide on the right to an open future by allowing this child time to make his own decision. Um, they could still discard the tissue later. So as we've gone through this discussion with the, the patient's parents, we do decide to go forward with performing an open testicular biopsy, the time of lumbar puncture. And they say, well, what can we do with it? Well, how, how is this situation that I've just described similar or different for transgender children or postpubertal transgender women? So while the, the patients are facing sterilizing treatment, it's, it's really different. Um, is there really a rush to do a testicular biopsy? So the type of patient who comes in may be prepubertal and is going to be on um, gonadotropin agonist or antagonist and will be basically kept in a prepubertal state often for many years, if not permanently. So is it worth it to do this kind of a biopsy right now when the child is say 12 or 13 years old or is it worth it to do it later, later on? Um, but when a patient is undergoing an orchiectomy, then a decision has to be made at that time. For postpubertal patients who have gone through puberty before uh, starting with gender affirming hormones, they often use spironolactone and estrogen rather than a gonadotropin agonist or antagonist. So for, for patients, essentially adoption is, for these patients, essentially adoption is always an option. Um, and so the, this focus on genetically rated offspring for trans-identified children um, may or may not be um, important, but it's, it's, it is important to discuss. I find that an important part of the consultation for, for patients is really talking about really some of the, the fundamental aspects of how you're gonna use these samples down the road. So, so for a patient who is single, and who imagines the or imagines the partner that they have um, uh, down the road? If the patient does not have a partner, then they're going to need a uh, egg donor as well as a gestational carrier. For patients who have a cisgendered female partner, they could consider timing sex with ovulation, depending on the the if they still did have ejaculated sperm. Um, they could consider intrauterine sperm. Um, intruder insemination with frozen sperm. They could do in vitro fertilization or consider uh, surrogate and, and gestational carrier. Uh, if their preferred partners were transgender male partners, they'd have the same options. If their partners were cisgendered male, again, they'd need to go down the path of using donor eggs in a carrier and likewise transgender female partners. So this is really is complicated because as you're banking sperm for patients, so say a post-pubertal patient, a 17, 18 year old patient, 20 year old patient who's contemplating um, uh, banking sperm before they start, start spironolactone and estradiol. So the, particularly younger patients don't, don't know. And I, I feel that it's important to have these discussions with patients because it, there's a direct impact on how many samples you bank. For patients who are in these categories, cisgender female patients or transgender male partners, IUIs are possible, but in that case, you need to bank a whole bunch more, more sperm. So this, this patient was a 13-year-old transgender girl who calls 
the parents called about fertility preservation. Since age nine, this patient had been taking Lupron and she was planning bottom surgery with a bilateral orchiectomy. Had four milliliter testis bilaterally. And so the discussion that often comes up is how do these medications given to suppress testosterone affect spermatogenesis? And again, what, what options, what fertility preservation options are, are applicable here? So at this, for this particular patient, um, I, the patient had, was undergoing an orchiectomy and I took the testicular tissue and I dissected the testicular tissue out. And we found a number of both round cells um, as well as um, there were rare elongating spermatids and spermatids in these samples. Um, uh, many what looked like secondary spermatocytes. Um, and so this, this tissue was, was frozen. So uh, for older patients who are using estradiol spironolactone, um, is it possible to bank sperm for these patients? So does long-term use of these medications affect spermatogenesis? So essentially what's happening with Lupron is it's, it's completely shutting down to shutting down follicle stimulating hormone release as well as luteinizing hormone release. So there's little production to no production of testosterone from Leydig cells within the testis. And Sertoli cells are no longer getting stimulation by follicle stimulating hormone. Spironolactone is essentially cutting down on the production of, of testosterone. So in a, in a study that uh, where we explored these, these patients uh, from a few years ago, we found that patients who were on a variety of therapy did often have sperm, but their semen volume was lower. The sperm concentration was lower, motility was lower, and the number of vials frozen were all also often much lower. So the, the, the main point of, of this work is to say that for patients who have been on therapy for a while, it's worth getting a semen analysis. It's worth looking just to see if there, there is any sperm because some patients will have sperm to bank, don't necessarily need to come off of their therapy. Um, so going forward for these patients, what are some of the, the options moving into the future? So one possible option is taking these testicular cells out and transplanting them back to uh, the, the patient. And this, this, these techniques have been utilized in many mammalian species going back to the mid 1990s. And recently, as of the, the last uh, five to 10 years, been done in monkeys. This type of technique might potentially allow natural conception as you'll, you'll see in the next couple of slides um, or in vitro fertilization. And another possibility is to uh, perform in vitro maturation of spermatogonia. And you start with this small testicular biopsy and in a three-dimensional gel, grow, grow sperm from these samples. This approach would require IVF and ICSI. So in work done by Kyle Orwig, Orwig and Brian Herman, at then uh, when Dr. Herman was at Pittsburgh, utilize prepubertal as well as postpubertal rhesus macaque monkeys and uh, performed a, an orchiectomy prior to busulfan. This tissue was processed to single cells um, and the, the tissue was, was then transplanted back. These, this testicular slurry was essentially transplanted back into the cell. Uh, the, the central portion of the testis called the ready testis and the biopsies of these monkeys many months later demonstrated sperm production. So uh, in, in work done at our lab, we've been working to uh, demonstrate the feasibility of doing this in human testicles and in, in work that is under review now, demonstrating a, a technique that, that urologists could learn. And the technique is, um, is straightforward, but uh, does, does require some ex expertise to accomplish, but it's passing a needle into the ready testis under ultrasound guidance. So this type of, of approach might allow a lower, ultimately a lower cross technique if these sperm stem cells found their niche restored spermatogenesis um, potentially could be utilized for older patients and potentially be paradigm shifting, um, may improve access um, to care. The, some of the complexities of that approach though really need to be, need to be worked out. And this, this has never been done in, in humans.
Now this process of in vitro maturation of spermatogony, you start with a small source material, would require IVF. And this technique has been performed in, uh, in mice and it, utilizing newborn mouse tissue um, it, and a three, uh, maturing these cells in a three-dimensional gel, it has been possible to identify sperm and perform uh, mouse in vitro fertilization with uh, multiple generations of healthy mouse pups. Um, and most recently, a very interesting paper from Dr. Orwig at, uh, in Pittsburgh demonstrated that taking testicular tissue out, this, this tissue could be transplanted back under the skin of, they did it both on the skin of the back as well as the skin of the scrotum. And uh, for patients, for, for monkeys uh, rather, this monkey uh, did grow uh, sperm in this, the little nodes of tissue that was transplanted. And this, these, the sperm that was identified was utilized for rhesus macaque in vitro fertilization and uh, resulted in healthy monkey offspring. And this uh, baby monkey was named Grady. It was the first time that a primate demonstrated success. This particular technique is really powerful. It's straightforward, and it, this could be applied in, in uh, patients who had a normal functioning pituitary axis. For our transgender patients, this is probably not the, the, going to be the best approach because the, essentially if the patient has been on gonadotropin um, releasing hormone um, agonist or antagonist, there's going to be no normal FSH and LH, no normal um, testicular function, no testosterone to support. Uh, this approach. So, um, and think of some of the challenges um, in summarizing, you know, there are often logistical challenges, setting these up ahead of time, working, working through the, the system is really important. Um, it's important to continue to measure these fertility outcomes in large cohorts of survivors and eventually develop better prediction tools for everyone. Many questions also remain about how big of a biopsy to take. Um, uh, we've done, tend to err on, this, on a smaller size biopsy to minimize harm to patients, but we don't know if we'll need larger amounts of tissue to actually uh, preserve or restore fertility. Um, moving forward, being able to differentiate spermatogonial stem cells to sperm, developing in vitro and in vivo models are really important. Our protocol is called the PD Life protocol, um, also an ongoing protocol called the Restore study to uh, ultimately try to uh, preserve fertility for these patients. So uh, key take home points, collaboration between the clinical services, social workers, oncology, nursing, cryopreservation lab, urologists, is really important. And it's, this is a multidisciplinary field. Referring as early as possible is really is critical. Banking tissue or sperm prior to therapy is really the best, the best way to go. It is possible to preserve testicular tissue. Uh, there's still, this is an experimental process. Um, uh, it should be done under IRB um, protections. Forming a relationship with your patients and, and developing individualized plans, uh, developing, uh, uh, we're working with patients to bank as the number of samples that they uh, uh, find appropriate for them is uh, very, very important. And, these, and developing research collaborations between clinicians, basic scientists, and others to develop um, uh, uh, better ways to help our patients is really important. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention during this session. Uh, my email address for if you have any questions is james.smith at ucsf.edu. Feel, please feel free to reach out with me. I'd also like to uh, send my thanks as well to the Onco Fertility Consortium um, for their collaboration and assistance as well.